So Lisa, are you with me? Hello, Linda. We, hi, I can't see you yet. Okay, we're coming, we're coming. We're coming. There we are. There you are. We did it. There you are. Fabulous seeing you, ladies. So glad you're here. Really nice, Ellie. You and I match. That's yeah, I know. Cool. You're in Sunways blue. You're perfect yes. for the occasion. <laughs> I'm a blue girl. Well, welcome, ladies. I hope you've enjoyed the conference so far, and I look forward Great. to your presentation. Yeah, and thank you so much for having yeah, us. Yeah, we are we are pumped to to be here, and the presentations so far have been amazing. Just like you said, we've already learned so much. We're excited for all the ones after us as well. So we're excited to jump into it. Um, and I guess we should say um, we're not the most technical of people, so we're hoping that it us. goes without issues, right? Linda's like, yes, I got yeah, I you. Get it. <laughs> um, so I guess, would we just share our screen, Linda, to be able yes. to, to share? Yes. Okay. All right, I'm, I'm walking out. I'll see you girls in a bit. Okay. Okay. Desktop. Okay. All right. Well, we're having some difficulties with the slides, so just just give one, us one second. It's okay. Take your time. Um, sharing here. the preferences there. And have you approved us to be able to share our screen? Yes. Okay. Maybe advanced. I'm gonna go downstairs and ask my producer. Okay. What? He said you can, you just need to find the right button on your end. Okay. Okay. Well, as we're trying to figure it out on our end, we're not gonna keep you guys waiting for, for so long. We're just gonna kind of jump right into it. We'll we'll add some um, interest by all of our hand gestures. How about that, right? <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll keep oh, it interesting with our, with our little hands. song and dance. <laughs> Um, I guess part of the lessons of senior care, right? We should have added that is being rolling with the punches. <laughs> yes, yes. Being yeah. able to pivot and roll with the punches. I don't know if anybody on here can relate <laughs> to exactly. that. Um, but thanks for your patience so far. So I am Ellie Baldwin. This is Lisa Keith. We are part of Sunway's Senior Living Concierge. Um, and just to give some context into what we're going to be talking about today and what Sunway's is, is we're essentially a free service for seniors and their caregivers and family members to navigate this maze of senior care, um, like we like to say. So essentially help with um, locating local care options, whether that's in-home care and resources, as well as placement into senior care communities, um, whether that's independent living, assisted living, memory care, et cetera. Um, Lisa and I have both navigated this process um, individually in our family, um, in our families, right, separately, but that's really where our why comes in and why we do what we do. We know that um, when you are navigating this, there's so much information or lack of that becomes very overwhelming. Yeah. And so hopefully today it's going to be really um, shedding some light on what to be looking for. Um, we're going to be going on a road trip, so to speak, and that's kind of what our slides were all about, is our road trip. Um, we're going to be going on a road trip, so to speak, with some different stops along the journey of senior care, um, touching on resources and options that we get a lot of questions about, and um, hopefully that's shedding some light on what could be part of not only a plan A for you or a loved one, but also a plan, plan B, B or C. <laughs> Potentially. Um, so talking about maybe the importance of planning. Yeah, so that jumps right into it. Um, uh, so the importance of planning and knowing your options and not, you know, avoid making big decisions in times of crisis. So when you're in the middle of a crisis, um, your stress levels are up and that can really negatively affect your decision making process. So um, and then increase the likelihood of 
making a bad decision. Right. So nobody wants to make such a big life decision under pressure. So, um, so really, really, you know, getting something set up and in place and, and having a plan in place. Absolutely. And I think that there's like also a a certain level of fear that if we invite these thoughts or we invite this information, that somehow that's opening us up to the universe, delivering it for us. That's not the case. What's going to happen is going to happen. And it's really what level of, you know, preparedness we're at um, to kind of deal with those blows and deal with those punches. So in the same sense, not just having a plan A, because we all kind of know, okay, this is, this is the journey we want to go on. Um, but also having a plan B and a plan C. Um, So it's really important ahead of time to know what your options are and what's available out there. Um, It never hurts to get ahead of the game. So start planning right away. Um, And I think a lot of times, you know, just coming out and checking out different senior living options um, takes away a lot of the um, the stress or the preconceptions of what senior living communities are. Um, and tours are also the best way to get a feel for the community. Yes. Um, you get to see how people are interacting with each other, the kind of stuff that they're doing. Um, and it helps kind of show what might be a best fit for your well, loved one. I, I think it's good too for, because people that have not been to communities in recent years, mm-hmm. they're nothing yes. like, you know, they all think it's like one flew over the cuckoo's nest or something. Yeah. 100%. And, and you always promise mom, you always promise mom you would take care of her, but I have found that caregivers that went around and started touring different communities, mom was a whole bunch more open now as things went down the road. Right. No, that's such a great point. I mean, a lot of times it's like, I promised mom I would never put her in a home yeah. because in mom's eyes, they were nursing homes back in the seventies or even early eighties for that matter. And that's not, you know, what they look like and what our options yeah. are now. A lot uh, of times I, 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 think yes, I say to caregivers, just tell your loved one, I will always take care of you. Don't right. Say, right. I like I that. will never put you in a quote unquote home, but I will always take care of you. I'll always take care of you. Keep you yeah. safe. Yep. Yeah. No, love that. That's a that's a great point for but a sure. A lot of the, the times these places I do a tour and I'm like, oh my, how how can I sign up? Right. I would love to live here. Yeah. I have all my meals made, my house done. I know they, they don't take kids under yeah. 12 though, from what I, I've asked many times. And I said, as soon as you let let my kids, I'm I have my deposit ready to go. Yeah. <laughs> so another um importance of planning ahead is um 80% of the calls that we typically get. Families are in an urgent crisis situation. Right. Um, So the majority of calls we receive are like that, maybe a fall or a significant change in care needs, a stroke, a hospitalization. Um, And trust me, you don't want to be on the receiving end of the phone when you get a call from a case manager saying, I'm sorry, but your loved one will not be able to discharge home safely you need to find other arrangements right. and you have 24 hours to do this. Yes, exactly. Especially if no pre-planning has been done in terms of budget, finances, applying for any sort of aid, um, et cetera. So um, we, yeah. we, we do try to avoid that from a standpoint of planning as much as humanly possible. For uh, sure. somebody, somebody just asked, do you only offer assistance for folks living in Florida? No, technically. I mean, we are not a franchise. Sunway Senior Living Concierge concierge is not a franchise, so we're able to work anywhere in the country. Obviously, um, we have a team of nine, and our team is headquartered mostly on the Sun Coast. So we have helped families in other states. Um, As you can imagine, we get a lot of phone calls from you and family and friends that live other places to help them along in the journey. Um, obviously, we haven't walked the halls of those communities or those resources and are as hands on as we are here in the Sun Coast. But we, but we can still can add a lot of insight and, and save you a lot of time just from an education standpoint. So definitely still reach out. Yeah, because just just realize they did all the homework for you guys already. Right. right. You just got to show up for class. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so the next one, um, caregiver burnout is real. I know yes. you'll like this one, Linda. Um, And respite breaks are so very important. So caregiver burnout happens when a caregiver um, doesn't get the help that they need, or they try to take on too much and they try to do everything. 
And I'm sure a lot of people can um, relate to that. Right. Um, and if you follow Linda at all, you know how much she preaches the importance of caregiver self-care. So um, whether that's reaching out to another family member to come over for a couple hours so you can you know, go take a walk on the beach or reaching out to a friend or hiring private caregivers to come in and help. Um, there's adult day centers, which we're going to touch on later on down the road on right. our road trip. Exactly. Um, and also most uh, senior living communities offer respite options for weeks at a time or even months at a time. Yes. So um, the main point is that you can't pour from an empty cup. Um, so have options in place to ensure that you're able to get the support that you need so you can continue to give your loved one the best of you. Yes. You, don't, you don't want to be getting frustrated. and um, Well, absolutely. And I mean, Linda, if anybody can speak to this, it's you. I mean, how many times does all, you know, all the attention is on the person that actually needs care and it's the caregiver that actually ends up having a sudden an fall or, or an yeah. illness or going into the hospital and because of the lack of planning and they're just run down. Right. right. And so we, we need to make sure that we're caring for the caregiver um, as much as anything else yep. um, for sure. In this, and that's also a great point is, um, you know, a lot of caregivers that we talk to have a plan in place for their loved one. But, you know, they haven't thought about what if something happens to me? Right. What if right. I get sick? What if I end up in the hospital? Um, right. Who's going to take care of my loved one? So having a plan in place and making sure that, you know, that's solidified, um, just like all the options that we just talked about, respite care, um, you know, reaching out to family, you know, hiring private caregivers, um, but having a plan in place in, in case you're in a situation and, um, and your loved one yeah. is stuck with and, 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 and I'll continue to boast the support groups because I'll tell you, when you come to a support group, you find out you're not alone, you're not as frustrated, uh, and you find people that are going through the exact same thing as you because we yes. think we're super caregivers. You know, I'm the bomb caregiver and no one can do it like I do. Mm -hmm. Believe yeah. me, any, anybody could go grocery shopping for you. Or something like that. You don't have to be the bomb caregiver to do that. Right. Right. It is. It's it's so hard, but it's so, so true for sure. Um, so jumping in kind of um on our road trip, so to speak. Again, yeah. we had some slides, but instead you just got a picture, you're ah, in the back seat. Yep, we're driving. Like, I don't know, you're driving. Okay, I'm I'm the passenger. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know who's driving Miss Daisy over here. <laughs> Um, but the first um, stop on our kind of caregiver journey is on in-home care, because at least in our experience, when there are any sort of care changes, typically the first place that folks are going to reach to to start implementing support is going to be in-home care or, or trying to at least. So how we can think about in-home care is there's kind of two sides of the fence. There's the side of Medicare home health. And then there's the other side of the fence, which is private duty caregiving services. Okay. So the first side of the fence, Medicare home health, um, as you can tell by the name, um, these are Medicare services. The pro of this, these types of services is that those services are covered by your Medicare insurance or your loved one's Medicare insurance. And it's specifically going to cover things like physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, wound care, things along those lines. Um, they will come directly into the home. A lot of times folks think that you have to go to outpatient or go to a gym. That's not the case. They can come to the home. Another preconceived notion is that there has to have been a hospitalization or a crisis or something to have, occur have occurred to get an order for that. That is also not the case. Even some changes in mobility and some decline a doctor can write those orders, okay, to come into the home. Um, and um, that kind of leads us into more of the con, right? We talked about the pros. It's great services coming to the home covered by Medicare. The con of that is that they are very limited because they are covered by insurance, right? So it's typically only going to be maybe two or three times a week at max. And there's usually going to be a cutoff as well. It's usually only going to be anywhere between like on average six weeks, I'd say, and then they're going to cut off those services. So um, they're coming in for a reason and they're leaving. Yeah. They're not just helping for support as you're running errands, et cetera. Um, so the other side of the fence is private duty caregiving services. And that's usually 
what people when somebody thinks I need home care, they're thinking private duty. Private duty means private pay, right? So um, it's typically in our area um, in the Sun Coast of Florida around thirty-five dollars an hour, with usually about a three or four hour minimum per shift to come out. But they can help with as little or as much as you need, right? Um, with any activity of daily life, dressing, grooming, bathing, transferring, um, even shopping, shopping, like yes. housekeeping. You know, maybe they come every Tuesday and they change out the sheets while they're helping do other things around the house, right? So it's really support not only for somebody that might need hands-on care, but also the caregiver support as well um, and allows, it could be once a week to run errands or go out to lunch with friends up to 24 seven, if that could be afforded. Um, as you can imagine, it can get expensive. If you're having somebody come into the house every day for over four or five hours a day, usually that, you know, seven days a week, five hours or so a day, is where we see the pendulum swing to it being more affordable to stay home, mm -hmm. to being more affordable going into a senior living community. But every situation is a little bit different. Um, anything I'm missing on the home care piece with I that? Think, I think that, yeah, I think you covered it. Okay, well, Linda, were there any questions about home yeah, care on there? Not home care, but one said, is COVID in Florida um, facilities, communities, or with home health a concern? Um, well, I think that that's kind of a, a personal, um, you know, question of, of how much of a concern. I mean, there's definitely COVID protocols. Were you going to say something on that? I was going to say it's kind of, it's up and down and it's different everywhere. Um, and yes. I, I wouldn't say it's as huge as a safety concern. Right. Definitely. I know communities or in skilled nursing, um, if there is somebody, you know, they have protocol that they, that they follow to ensure everybody stays safe. Right. Um, it's not as big of a worry as it was a couple years ago. Yeah. Um, and definitely, you know, they're not closing the doors in assisted livings and you're not able to come and visit your right. loved ones, um, stuff like that. So it's definitely different. Yeah. Yeah. Usually you'll find like in senior living communities, there'll be protocols if somebody is COVID positive for isolation and only certain caregivers being able to care for that person. And most senior living communities that um, we go to also have a check-in protocol where you're getting your temperature taken, you're checking in, they're asking you questions about travel, et cetera. So that's still going on. So they're trying to do the best that they can to really prevent any sort of spread for sure. But so that's a good it, question. So the question is, so if I have a professional come into my house, can I ask them to take a COVID test before they come in? I would, I would assume so. And yeah. I think um, different home care companies have different rules set in place, but, yeah. um, but I'm sure that every, any home care company would, would absolutely work with you to feel I would think so. safe and comfortable think so. in that way. You, yeah, you absolutely would, so. would not be the only person asking oh, yeah. those questions, right? So they're going to have a response and it's just whether or not you agree with the stance that they have and what they have protocols they have in place. Right. But if you are looking for a home care company, whether it's the Medicare home health or the private duty home care company um, to fit into certain protocols, still reach out to us. We'll be able to connect you with different ones so that you can kind of interview them to understand their criteria to see if it's up to your standards. And, and I'll say once again, you want to interview them before the crisis. Mm -hmm. Yes. Before Absolutely. the crisis. Yeah. So that way you have the phone number, right? You have in case of the emergency, you know, you've already done your due diligence of knowing yeah. what services you're going to be using. 100% agree with that. Somebody also asked, maybe you can send out the slides after, and I'm sure we can do that. Yes, yes no, we definitely will. <laughs> okay. We, we no have problem. somebody that's a lot more tech savvy. Who's and, probably watching this, like she's fighting her, like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you had one job, get the tech right, one job. <laughs> We've been practiced. Um, okay. So next on our little road trip, our next, our second stop is um, adult day centers. Yes. So um, not many people are as familiar with what adult day centers are and what they offer, um, but uh, it's typically they're open Monday through Friday from nine to five. They're set up like structured, um, very similar to senior living communities um, in the sense that they have um, lots of activities. Sometimes they go on field trips, they provide meals, um, you know, you're around other people. So there's that socialization. Yeah, so um, so the average cost of adult daycare centers is typically around $135 a day. 
Um, although there are some that will do hourly um, and even half days. So it's just a matter of, you know, finding what's going to work best for you. Um, uh, also, uh, Medicaid will cover the cost um, uh, at some adult day centers. Some adult day centers accept Medicaid. Um, and there are veterans benefits that also cover cost of adult day centers. Yeah, and places um, like Neighborly, uh, Neighborly Care Network, it's a whole different scale there. It is. So don't give up if you think you can't afford it, because uh, there, there are many are options. Different options. Yeah. yeah, there definitely are. But such a great resource um, because, you know, the benefit of in-home care, obviously, is that the care needs, the physical care needs, and the safety is being taken care of. But what is neglected in that situation is really the isolation that can occur. Yeah. Yeah. And I think everybody on this call, just all of us, no matter what our ages are coming out of COVID, understand yeah. the impact of isolation. <laughs> yeah. Right. So it is. It's a great way for your loved one to get so socialization. Yeah. Um, be involved in activities throughout the day. Um, and they even have areas like quiet areas where you can work on a puzzle or go sit uh -huh. in a room and, and read a book. So it doesn't have to be going, going, going all day. Um, they also provide meals and snacks, usually hot meals right. um, for your loved one. So, um, and it's also sometimes a great introduction if, um, you know, you know, in the future, uh, assisted living is going to be yeah. needed. Um, it's a great introduction to kind of get used to that structure. Yeah, on both ends, as a caregiver, letting go of that control, but also as somebody that might be moving into a community of really seeing what that type of environment's yeah. all about, um, def definitely eases that transition for sure. Yeah. So um, one of the people just said, um, before my mom moved into a community, adult daycare saved my life. Yeah. She said, my mom didn't want to go and I got her to go because I told her that I needed some important doctor's appointments that I needed to go to. And she said, she went once, she went twice. And then before I know it, she was upset because it wasn't open on Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's such a great example. And we can't tell you how many times, you know, the pushback that we do get from caregivers is just going back to what you said, Linda, that they'll never go. This will never work. They would never be able to care for them like we right. do, right? They, and they hold that guilt. And the, and the guilt, yep. yep. And, and uh, it's okay to use a therapeutic lie yes. to, to get your loved one in. Yes, and, um, and then they end up loving it. And it is such a great, you know, going back to the transition, it's such a great way to start to loosen up that control, but knowing that you're going to go be going and picking them up in a couple yeah. hours, right? And so it, you're able to kind of let, let that go um, a little bit more. It's not so overwhelming for sure. Yeah. She said it was a great introduction because when it came time that my mom needed to be, uh, needed to move into a community to be safe, she was not, we weren't as scared as we would have been. Exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the fear to, I mean, there's also always a transition. I always use the phrase, I don't care if you're nine or you're 90 right. transitions stink. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, imagine, you, you know, changing schools, moving to a new town, let alone like moving into a senior living community yeah. or going to adult Scary. day. It is, it's, it's overwhelming no matter what, but when you see it work with adult day of after three or four times, they loved it. It's knowing that even if they move it, you know, your loved one moves into assisted living or memory care and the first week or so they aren't loving it or they're pushing back knowing that like, well, that's what they said last time. Right. And we got out of that. So it's kind of like a proof positive um, that it, it can end well, which okay, is great. I have another question here is Medicaid adult daycare centers only in states that pay into state tax. How can I find list by state of Medicaid day care centers? So that's a great question. Um, I don't know about adult day in other states other than, other than the Florida. Medicaid, yeah, um, and I don't know, I guess state by state looking up. Um, the local agency area, on aging yeah. is, is in every state. And I know that that essentially in the state of Florida, but also other states are usually the state government kind of arm that handles Medicaid. So if you look up the local um, area on area agency, area agency on aging, uh -huh. there's so many A's there. 
that uh, that could be a good place to start to see if they have resources. But unfortunately, we're not sure on the on the adult day. Okay. Being that Medicaid is a state funded, um, you know, benefit. It is different state to state, you know, right. even, you know, our next section, us talking about senior living, we are lucky in the state of Florida that Medicaid funds can cover some assisted living and memory care costs, um, not in all communities, but in some that choose to utilize it. And, uh, but Florida's many, like one of the few states that do, yeah. usually in order to access Medicaid funds for, for long-term care services, you have to be in skilled nursing or what people would refer to as a nursing home. So we are lucky in Florida that way. So yeah, it's just looking at that up in your state. Okay, one more question. Do you have a checklist of how to get started? Like what to do first? Get an attorney, have all the papers in order, interview in home, case of urgent need, look for assisted living. I don't think we have a list, but we can make one up, right? Yeah, and actually we have something similar to that on our website. So okay. at the very end, we're gonna have, well, we don't have a slide. So actually we'll just do it now and repeat ourselves at the end. Yes. So our website is sunwayssenioriving.com. That's S-U-N-W-A-Y-S, seniorliving.com. And again, with our slides and our contact information, we'll send a link to be able to send it out to everybody. But if you go to our website, there are so many free resources that we've created. Um, checklists, not only for what to do next, but also if you were to, to tour a senior living community, questions to, to ask, um, tools to be able to compare costs of in-home care and costs of staying home versus a senior living community, um, pros and cons, like just veteran benefit information, so much. There's also a caregiver blog on there. So I would definitely um, recommend checking that out. But I will say that, you know, everybody's journey is very unique. I mean, a lot of what we're talking about today is very high level overarching information, but everybody, ha everybody has their own story, needs, family dynamics, et cetera. So if you're starting this journey, I definitely recommend you reaching out to us just so instead of just giving you a blanket checklist, we can actually create a custom one for you based on that phone call so that you really have your action steps and we can be hand holding you through the process. That's what we do. And That's we're absolutely perfect. That. And I just put your website and all the information in the chat room. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. You're just like our creating our <laughs> slides via the chat room. We appreciate you. Linda. <laughs> Um, you didn't know that you're going to have to be so active on our presentation, did you? <laughs> That's okay. I like the action. There you go. That's true, right? All right. Yeah. So we're 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 all the way to our third stop. Yes, we're on, on our, our third trip. stop, and that is senior living communities, right? So we kind of started alluding into this, and there's four different types of senior living communities that we're going to kind of run through. Again, very overarching information here. But um, the first one being independent living, then assisted living, then memory care, and then last but not least, skilled nursing environment, both for short-term rehab as well as long-term care. So the first one is independent living. Um, we get calls and questions about independent living a lot um, because I think the term assisted living is scary, scary to many. But for independent living, that is a community type setting and really is best suited for somebody whose primary reason for moving is convenience and socialization, because that's what they're going to provide the most. You're going to have a private apartment, a lot of times a full kitchen. There will be usually anywhere between one to three meals a day, depending on the situation. But, you know, there's dining, activities, transportation, but everything's all included, utilities, et cetera. So you don't need the bug guy the pool guy, utilities, like it really simplifies day-to-day -day life so that you can have fun and enjoy retirement essentially. Yeah. Um, but that being said, in the state of Florida, and I'm pretty sure throughout the country, independent living is not licensed mm -hmm. to provide care. Meaning if you're living in a true independent living apartment or community and you need care, you have to do exactly what we talked about earlier on our first stop. You need to bring in private duty or bring in um, Medicare home health, they're yeah. not going to provide care at that community. So if the primary reason for you looking for a community for your loved one or for yourself is because of care changes, 
independent living is not for you. That's just being frank about the situation. Um, so the next step up from that is assisted living. It is um, kind of a preconceived notion that assisted living is a nursing home, right? Where everybody might be in wheelchairs or very low functioning, nobody's talking and it's kind of dark and clinical. That's not the case. Um, there's a lot of assisted living communities that can feel like a five-star hotel. Depends on budget, obviously. But, um, you know, you can still have a private room. You could have a studio, one bedroom. I mean, you could have a two bedroom with a balcony in assisted living. And most people don't know that. Um, by uh, law, at least in the state of Florida, you will get three meals a day. You will have laundry and housekeeping services, transportation. A lot of time doctors and specialists will round at the community so that you're not having to go take your loved one out on a ton of visits. Yes. Um, and utilities, all of those things are included. Assisted living can handle everything from simple medication management all the way up to, you know, really max assist with all activities of daily life. Um, yes. One to two people helping with dressing, grooming, bathing, um, transferring, et cetera, and hospice can be brought in. So the goal is somebody can move into assisted living, even still very independent but be able to age in place in their home, their new home in their assisted living apartment and um, through end of life, you know? We have two comments here, I think are, are good to look at. Okay. okay. One is I always thought for my mom to move into a community be way too expensive. I would never be able to afford that. When I sat down and I figured out how much she paid the lawn guy and the electricity and the homeowner's insurance and the transportation and everything, it was almost equal. Yeah. She said, and I found then that I had a team, not just for my mom. I had a team for me, mm-hmm. right? Um, which I think is a great comment. And, and the other I ones, love that. Sometimes yeah. we can even look into other creative payer sources that they, you know, families can have in addition to that. But I think that happens a lot. At least I get a lot of calls and families think, oh, we could never afford this. We can't. Um, but when you really break it down um, and look at things, so, you know, being a free service for families, the best thing to do is, is call us yeah. and we really kind of peel back all the layers um, to find out what's going on and really try to dig in deep to, to come up with the, the best solutions. Yeah, from a budget perspective, because that, that is, I thank you for sharing that comment. It is so true because a lot of times a sticker price of, you know, what, $3,000 or $4,000, but when we peel it back and see not only the bug guy and, and the, the utilities, et cetera, but it's just insurance. Yeah. And, and home care, like I said earlier with the home care, I mean, if, if care changes are happening and private duty caregiving services are coming in at $35 an hour, usually if they're coming in every day, seven days a week for longer than that four or five hour, like basic shift, it's more affordable to move into a community. Um, for yeah. just, you know, month to month costs. So, and, and it's also more important because now you have a team, the kids exactly. have the team and the loved one has a team. Yeah. Uh, another question here is, aren't there communities where you start out in independent and then go to assisting and then go further in the same place? Question. Yeah. Continuing care communities. Yes. So, yep. And they're set up um, for, you know, all those levels of care. Um, there's even some communities that you can start off in an independent living um, apartment. And as your level of care changes, you can stay in that same apartment and they can kind of add services on. So every, every community is very unique. They all hold different licensing for different levels of care. Um, so really, you know, talking to somebody like one of us that are in and out of these communities all the time, um, that can go through all those different, uh, types of communities. Right, because in both assisted living and memory care, which we're going to be talking about next, which is licensed through the state, right, to be regulated and making sure that they're doing what they need to be doing. Yeah, um, it's ACA here in Florida, but um, they are going to have a you know director of nursing. They're going to have like a nursing staff. Staff. They're going to have an executive director. They're going to have a caregiving team. They're going to have med techs. So they're going to have an entire team that are also going to be able to report to you as a caregiver so that you are um, knowing what's going on and making sure that your loved one is getting what they need and really can be as involved or as not involved as 
you need to be or want to be um, in the process, right? But that's um, a great point. Having having a team is important because you know we say all the time it's like we as a family caregiver, you know we have we have clients that literally were caregivers, right? We're CNAs or we're nurses, worked at hospitals, and then the t- they're on the other side of the table where they're the care the family caregiver, and it's it's a whole different ball game because you know a, a caregiver, an external caregiver, can clock out, right? But as a family caregiver, you're 24 yeah, seven and you weren't, you know, trained in that way. And so it's really important to have a true medical clinical team that can really be layering that in. So that's a great point. Okay. Were there any other questions there? Um, nope, Linda? We're on paper now. Okay, perfect. The only other thing that I will say on assisted living before we switch to memory care, and this actually goes for memory care as well as our transition is that, um, a lot of assisted living communities will offer respite care. So even if you're not sure you want to do a long-term stay, or maybe there's a scheduled surgery that you have as a caregiver, or you want to go um, to to California for a wedding for two weeks, they can, it's essentially like a hospital stay. You pay a daily rate. It's usually in our area for assisted living around $200 a day, give or take. And it's a furnished apartment includes all care. You literally show up with your suitcase and your toothbrush and you're able to access all of those amenities. Um, it's hard to find somebody to do respite for less than two weeks. I won't say impossible, yeah. but most communities will want to do at least two weeks up to a month or so. But that's a really great way just to layer on. And another reason why it's important to kind of get ahead of the game and explore some communities just in case an emergency pops up. If, it, if a hospital stay was needed, we have something we can implement right away, even just for a short time to deal with a crisis. Well, I think it's, it's a very good introduction for your loved one for the future. So if we can do this when it's not in a crisis situation, um, it just changes everything. I, I had one woman say, I put my mom, my mom had a respite care stay and didn't have to go into a community till like eight months later, but the transition was so much easier. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It takes, it takes a lot of the fear away. Like um, Lisa was talking about earlier for sure. And with memory care, with that transition, um, obviously, you know, also a memory care stay could be a short-term respite, usually around $250 a day. Um, but can also be long-term and memory care. Also, if you've never toured a memory care community has some preconceived notions tied to that phrase, but a lot of memory care communities can look very similar to even assisted living, um, where there's dining rooms, activity rooms, outdoor areas, they're taking field trips. There's still very high functioning residents there, but everybody in memory care is obviously going to have some level of progressed cognitive decline through dementia or Alzheimer's. And really the, the main difference though, is a memory care unit will be secure because they wanna make sure that somebody isn't kind of confused thinking the front door is the door to their apartment. And also there's gonna be a higher uh, caregiver to resident ratio as well, because most um, all residents in that environment are gonna need some level of constant supervision. Even if it's not hands-on, it could be redirections, cues, reminders, things along those lines that they're set up to do. I think another thing um, that sets memory care apart is, uh, you know, a lot, the caregivers that work there, they get a lot more extensive training yeah. um, to uh, to be able to communicate most effectively. Um, and most of these full memory care communities um, that aren't just a part of, you know, they're they're designed. Yeah. For, purposely built. Yeah. They're purpose. Yeah. Purposely built. And, you know, people are able to walk around freely. They're not going to come to the end of a hallway and get agitated because they're not sure where they are. So yeah. there's lots of things that are put, um, in place, um, to keep some of, you know, to, to keep all of that in mind, you know, yep. little areas where you can s- stop and tinker with something or full, right baby clothes. Yep. So, um, so they're designed with, uh, and, and I think memory care is unique to everything else. And that if someone's looking for a memory care, they really need to look into it because I remember a couple of years ago, there was a community and they said, Oh, we have memory care all of a sudden. And it was on the third floor and everybody was up there locked up. Mm-hmm. That's not memory care. Right. So I want, I memory care, I think more important than even some of the other is to really check it out and go there for yourself and see what it's like. Yep. No, for sure. And, you know, and I know we said it multiple times and Lisa alluded to it in the beginning too, is 
that a lot of the fear and anxiety that we find our caregivers have in this process is purely because of the unknown. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's stories that we have in our head. It's stories we heard from somebody else. It's a visual we had from visiting our grandmother 23 years ago, you know, whatever it might be. And we hold on to these things. And in turn, we make it so much harder on ourselves than it needs to be. And by exploring communities or making those calls to some of those caregiver groups or checking out an adult day center, again, it does not mean that you are moving a loved one in next week. All it does is help you sleep at night, knowing that you know what the solutions are Right. Uh, there that are available. And I guarantee that you're going to come out of it feeling better. Like, oh my God, that was not as bad as I thought it was going to be. At least that's what we hear. Yeah. I mean, a majority of the time. Of that. That's, that's why you need a roadmap. Yep, absolutely. Um, and so our last um, kind of level of care, right, with senior living communities, so got kind of going from the lowest to the highest, independent living, assisted living, memory care, and now we're at skilled nursing. So skilled nursing facilities um, will typically have two wings. They'll have a short-term rehab and they'll have a long-term care wing. Um, not all of them. Some of them will be one or the other, but you know, I'd say 90% of the time you're going to have both. A short-term rehab is a great solution for, um, you know, instead of having some physical therapy services come into the home, you know, your Medicare, if you're on traditional Medicare, at least, um, will many times be able to provide up to hundred days of rehab a year that can provide really intensive physical therapy, occupational therapy. You know, if there's just, I like refer to it as like a tune up yeah. and especially if that's approved and we know that your loved one can go in there for anywhere between seven to 21 days. That also could be a solution covered by Medicare that is a respite that allows you know that your loved one's getting the care that they need, getting extra therapy to improve, but also gives you a break or to take that trip or whatever you need to do as a caregiver. Um, and then on the other you know side, the other wing of that long-term care facility is going to be the um, long-term section, which a lot of times is going to look and feel the same way as the rehab. It's just that there's no discharge in sight, right? Um, They're there to be able to provide um, until the end of life, the highest level of care possible, 24 seven nursing, um, et cetera. So that's really um, the long and short of that. So um, any questions um, there in the chat about rehabs or long-term skilled nursing or anything like that? No, just one person said, good info, gives me much to consider, thank you. Well, there you go, no, thank you. Um, even without the slides. All right. We're good. <laughs> um, so that kind of, those were our major stops that we, um, that we had here for our little road trip. Um, obviously kind of pulling things in full circle of some of the other things, like some of the things that we talked about today. Um, we just really cannot stress enough, um, if you haven't gotten the drift yet, about the um, about the, the need for, for pre-planning. And like Lisa had talked about in the beginning, because a lot of the calls that we do get are at the final, you know, the final hour, so to speak, in terms of, you know, hey, I thought mom was going to be able to discharge home and she's leaving in 48 hours. What do I do? Yeah. You don't want to be in a situation that you're really navigating those types of things, especially if you're an out-of-state caregiver or caring for somebody where you're not really there, boots on the ground. So um, I and know I think that's so important what you just said, especially if you're an out-of-state caregiver, because I think the out-of-state caregivers are the ones that really need your services because they're not here. Yeah, and they don't right. Know what's here. right. And and even the caregivers that live here, you know, I hear all the time, I'll, I'll, you know, have a conversation with a family member and they'll say, well, I want to go to this place because my hairdresser's mom went there. Right. Um, and, you know, in, in senior living, it's not one size fits all. Yeah. Or people ask me all the time, is this a place that you would feel comfortable with your grandmother living? Um, well, my grandmother's needs and your mom's needs are two totally separate things or the, you know, level of care that's needed, totally different. So I'm um, really talking to somebody that specializes. We like to say we're like um, a real estate agent for, for senior living. For this stage, yeah, this um, stage of the game. So, well, I you know, really- I, you guys, you guys are not like a place for mom. 
a place, no. for, you know, a place for mom. They'll be sending you a whole bunch of stuff in the mail and have 4,000 marketers calling you and you'll be more confused than ever. That's why I love about you gals, because you hold them by the hand. Right. Yes. And um, exactly. So, you know, just kind of giving insight into how, if you were to reach out to us, essentially, it's going to be um, Lisa having a phone call with you to actually understand what your unique situation is, because it is unique, even though we hear a lot of, you know, the same trends and things, um, you know, family dynamics, budget, amenities, care needs, all of these things are going to be part of our conversation to really see the big picture. And then we're going to be able to say, okay, what is our ultimate goal today? If that's staying home, okay, what can, who can we connect you with today to improve quality of life and be bringing in the resources that you need? Right. We're going to get that taken care of from an urgency perspective, but then we're going to be staying in touch to have another phone call to say, okay, now that the fire's out or now that step one's taken care of, um, what are we looking for, for long-term planning and really working through making sure that you do have everything in place, whether it's, have you been in touch with an elder care lawyer? Do we have, have all of our directives and POA and all of those things in place? Do we know who we're bringing in for home care? Have we looked at senior living communities? Um, is your loved one a veteran? Can we apply for veteran benefits or spousal benefits uh, of a veteran? Can we as Medicaid on the table? So these are all conversations that we're going to have, but specific to you and, and your situation. And the nice thing is because we're, you know, a third party, we aren't going anywhere. Right. So we have families that we've been supporting for years that started with calling us for a support group and an elder care lawyer, but every, you know, care change that happens, they call us, we arm them with the next step and then we're staying in touch. Right. So there's a couple of questions here. Do all these living communities have wait lists? No. Okay. Nope. Do Actually, any re- to be honest with you, most don't. Um, yeah. Because unfortunately people pass away and then there's a, a new place available. Right. And, you know, one thing that we didn't really touch on, and it's a little bit of a, a rabbit hole, so I don't want to go too deep down it, but with senior living communities, you kind of have two sides of the fence. You have CCRCs, which stands for continuing care retirement communities. Um, and then you have rental communities, CCRCs, not always, but I'd say 90% of the time will involve a larger buy-in, you know? So if you've ever dealt with somebody that had to, you know, they paid a hundred thousand, 500,000, et cetera, down, but then they moved into independent living, but then there was all levels of care there. That's a typical structure of a CCRC, but then there's also, and actually in our area in the Sun Coast, many more rental communities that are available that do not have a a buy-in. They have a small entrance fee of usually a couple thousand dollars. But after that, it's literally like an apartment. It's a rental. So even if you moved in and you didn't like it, or you moved in and you decided mom was going to move closer to somebody in Pennsylvania or whatever it might be, you give your 30 day notice and you're out of there. Right. So it, it, it offers a lot of flexibility from that standpoint. And usually those environments do not have wait lists. OK, another question. Do any rehab facilities offer PT seven days a week? Yes. Yeah. But that's a good question to ask. I mean, there's I mean, I would say a lot of them are going to say that they do no matter what. And it's kind of pushing on that, mm-hmm. but right. especially in acute rehab. Um, so with, with rehabs, you're going to have traditional skilled nursing facility mm-hmm. rehabs, but then the level up from that is an acute rehab. So an example, if you're here at local on the sun coast is like an encompass, which is up in Largo. There's also one down in Sarasota. There's one tied to, to Blake, which is in Bradenton. So there's okay. a couple different examples of that, but In those environments, um, it's usually only max like 14 to 21 days. That's up to like three to four hours of therapy a day, seven days a week. Okay. And one more question. Typical cost of skilled nursing. So skilled nursing, long-term care. um, So skilled nursing, long-term care is set up a little bit differently than um, the other senior living community options and that it's a daily rate because they're licensed as a hospital not Mm -hmm. as a assisted living or memory care community. So usually the daily rate for long-term care, again, just speaking on the Sun Coast, is anywhere between $350 and $400 a day. So that's usually anywhere between $10,000 to $12,000 a month, um, which I know is probably like many jaws just dropped. 
before the jaws drop too much. So one of the things with long-term skilled nursing though is um, majority, when I say a majority, I mean like 97% of those facilities do accept Medicaid. Yeah. And even if a loved one isn't eligible on paper for Medicaid, you can work with an elder care lawyer to yes. you know, help them get approved legally. So yeah. again, reach out to us about that situation and we'll get you in touch with the right person. Right. And tomorrow morning, everybody will be hearing from Sean Scott, elder care. Perfect. He's going to give a whole that's bunch That's the man of, you want to talk to for that. <laughs> his, his event is, is it even legal using Medicaid, PACE, and other benefits to pay for the cost of senior care? Exactly. Yeah. So that's a perfect, um, you know, if long-term care is what you think is what's needed, then that uh, session from uh, Sean is, is perfect to, to layer into that um, for okay. sure. That's all the questions for now. Okay. Well, um, I think looking at the time, we're kind of reaching towards the end of our overview too. Um, I know that that was majority of the information that we had to cover. Do you think that there's anything that we're missing, Linda, just even from your perspective? Um, First of all, one person just said, love the high energy and support system here today. Thank you, ladies. You're Uh, awesome. So we were okay without the slides. Yes, you were. It was all the the hand motions. (laughs) It's all about rolling with the punches. Yeah, uh, I would like to say is I want caregivers to know that just because your loved one goes into a community doesn't mean you're not the caregiver anymore. Yeah. And that you, you have still a different need- relationship with them. Yes. You know, you get to have your relationship back. Well, I get to be the daughter or the spouse, um, but I still need to be the squeaky wheel. So remember, wherever your loved one lives or who's ever taking care of them, the squeaky wheel gets the action. And I want you to do that and pay attention. Unfortunately, I see in Florida, there are some people in uh, in senior communities that have no one that visits them. No one checks up on them. Um, so I just want caregivers to be aware of no, that. No, I, I think that that's, that's a great point. And actually one thing that we advise um, our families when they do move a loved one in, especially for a family, a caregiver that is highly involved in caregiving and wants to stay, highly involved in caregiving Mm -hmm. is that we recommend to them that they really um, set those expectations at move in with the community. Because the thing is, is that, you know, it's not necessarily, you know, because sometimes the community in the beginning won't communicate that much. I think a lot of times caregivers are like, I should receive a call every single day with a check-in about how my loved one's doing. But what they don't understand is that there's a lot of families that have a loved one there that don't want those calls. And the only way that that community is going to know that that's what your expectation is. And honestly, your standard is by telling them that and telling them that often, like even on the tour, that this is what, like, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a community where I'm going to be able to call at any point. I'm going to be able to get an update, insisting on a weekly call with a director of nursing, like whatever it is, that's going to put your mind at ease. But unless we ask for it, the community isn't going to read our mind. They're not set up to do that just because honestly, a lot of families don't necessarily want that. So I think that that's a good point. Well, I I want caregivers to, I want you to think about this too. Please be kind to all those caregivers that are taking care of your loved ones in these communities, because you know how hard it is and you love your loved one. And now you have people that are there every day taking care of them and their job is hard. And I see a lot of caregivers in communities, families barely even talk to them. Talk to them. Find out what they like. Find out better ways that they can communicate with your loved one. Because if you have a relationship with them, it's better for everybody. Right. I love that. Yep. Yeah. But, you know, I I would always ask caregivers, So tell me, how many kids do you have? Do you like dogs? Where are you from? You know, is your mom still alive? And it's just a whole different ballgame. So please, caregivers, be kind to all the caregivers. Yep. No, I I love that. Caring for the caregiver, no matter what, what uh, lane of the caregiver you're in, right? (laughs) All right, ladies, what's the last thing you want our caregivers to hear today? Um, Call us, right? I guess could be our- And what is your website and what is your phone number? And you can reach us. Our local number is 727-314-6451. And your website? And our website is sunwayssenioriving.com. So that's S-U-N-W-A-Y-S, senioriving.com. 
Okay. And I put like all that Ellie information. Said, lots of great information on, on there. that website. We Check do, that out. We yeah. do we yeah. the, um, blogs on there. Um, so it's all sure good. Find lots of good stuff. So we'll, last, the last comment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great way to spend a morning. Appreciate the support. I am a daughter who moved in with my mother with early stage dementia. So I know I will use these resources. Yeah. Awesome. Yay. Thanks for putting this together. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you Linda. All the people you help. You're amazing. Yeah. And thank you guys all for, for joining. Hopefully it was um, enjoyable and we're excited to hear for the rest of the care, the uh, presenters yes. for the rest of the day. Yeah, because we're going to have a little break and then we're going to have sound bowl meditation. Ooh, oh, I need that. Okay. <laughs> yes. yes. That's it'll, what I'm talking yeah. about. It'll make all the slides go away. <laughs> All right, my friends, we'll talk soon. Have a delicious day. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.